Mary Meet, Annie here. This is a continuation of my series on the charge of the goddess. And we're going to talk about charge by definition and purpose this time. Let's start with by definition. When my first teachers were telling me what is a charge, they used the examples of the words in red in the Bible. Now I have to tell you, when they used that example, they were talking to somebody who had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't have much familiarity at that time in my life with the Bible. But in some versions of the Bible, the words in red are those words spoken by Jesus himself. Now, I was told the charge, in a way, compared to that in two ways. The first thing, it was the first person. In other words, we were not speaking of the goddess. The goddess was speaking to us in the first person. And also, it was the idea of words in red as, heads up, pay attention. This is being said for a purpose. There will be no wasted words in what you're about to hear or read, the words in red. And the word charge took on a very special meaning to me. <laughs> Not just to me, it's the meaning of the word in an archaic sense. A charge is a directive, something that tells us what to do. But the concept of the charge as a word in that archaic sense is that Whatever the mandate that comes down, whether it is telling us to take on a certain responsibility, certain actions, basically telling us what is expected of us, it is coming from a figure of authority. Someone we have chosen to have authority in our life. So, we know the charge then in the first person is the words spoken by the goddess, and it is also then as a charge the goddess telling us what she expects of us. To me, the power, though, of the word charge is you can be charged with something. So we're charged with devotion to the goddess. And she tells us in the charge what she expects us to do to prove that devotion. However, the charge is a two-way energy. When we're charged with a responsibility, the depth of the word charge is our willingness to take on the responsibility that we have been charged with. So it is listening to and taking in words from an authoritative figure in the sense that we have chosen the goddess, or we might say she chose us. Either way, we have decided that she has wisdom that we would like to seek. And so we listen to her words, and we take them upon her authority that she knows what's best in telling us what she expects of us, and we, in return, are charged with a responsibility. So charge is what comes to us, and it is also our dedication to that responsibility. The charge is not only what we hear, but it is what we do. And indeed, the charge, as most of us use it nowadays, that revised prose version that Doreen Valiente wrote, the first half of it is the goddess telling us what she expects of us. And the second half of it is her telling us, and here's what I carry as responsibility for you. Again, it's the two-way energy of the expanded concept of the word charge. Purpose. That's the other part of what this video is addressing. If you watched my first video on the charges of the goddess, I mentioned that Gardner's first version of the charge, and it is a beautiful and inspirational piece, had nothing to do with drawing down the moon, which I dare say is where most of us nowadays are familiar with linking in the charge to our rituals and what we do. That's not what he used the charge for. It was used as part of the challenge at an initiate's experience. Goddess, in other words, making it clear what she was demanding, charging the initiate with. The initiate's embracing of what the goddess expected are, and still are, an important part of the initiatory experience. Later, however, 
probably from the times of the rhyming version of the charge that Valiente wrote, and then especially when she did the common prose version, the charge started becoming more part of the experience of the full moon rite and the drawing down of the moon. It would not have been used as the act of drawing down the moon. It would have been a reminder of the expectations and the promises of the goddess, which are something that is front and foremost in our mind on the nights of the full moon. At some point, it became given in ritual that at the invocation of the priest invoking goddess into the priestess, that she would recite the charge of the goddess. And some traditionalists still are very upset with that. The concept of it doesn't need to be there. That there are not given words or recitations at that point. There is what moves through the priestess and what she brings to the circle. Some traditionalists believe that what happened is priestess either were not developing or were unaware of their responsibility to their coven as oracle. So they weren't having the true feeling of the goddess moving through them and speaking to the circle. So it was kind of a placeholder that when nothing happened or when they didn't know what to do, they recited the charge. So you may encounter that attitude here and there. And in fact, I have often encountered it, especially from traditionalists who have experienced drawing down the moon without the charge being part of that process. But here's my thoughts on that. Because we are, you and I, no matter my experience in covens, we are now solitaries together, and we are experiencing solitary rites. Most of us who are mimicking traditional Wiccan rites are using the charge of the goddess when we draw down the moon. And in fact, in public rites and open circles, it's being used consistently as part of drawing down the moon. Here's why. I think it is powerful in that sense. The first thought that I have is from my priestess perspective. It brings the priestess back to kind of her priestess vulnerability, where she is reminded by listening to the words as she says them, what she is a channel to this thing that is so much greater than her that she is going to bring into her circle the energy, if not the words, she'll bring into the circle of the goddess. When she recites the charge of the goddess to prepare herself for the drawing down, and I do make the distinction, it's not the drawing down, it is preparing for the drawing down. She is taking a journey back to that moment in time at her initiation when she stood in circle, challenged the first time in that environment by the words of the goddess saying this is what you will do and here is what I promise. As far as I'm concerned it is a good thing for the priestess who is going to draw down the moon to be taken back to that place of abject humility before the goddess. That first step into her arms in circle. It does no harm for the priestess to revisit that every time she draws down the moon. It's a reminder to her of the power of what she's doing in the sense of what is not at all of her. It's a trust, an openness, a vulnerability. In a way, it opens a channel between her and goddess. So I adore hearing a priestess in circle recite the charge of the goddess. You know, I have my quirks. I'm not much on having somebody read it from a piece of paper or shuffle things around or forget it in the middle of it. But the recitation of it means that that priestess is going to that place where she is reminded that we are always at the edge of mystery. And in circle. Taking my priestess mind, putting it aside for a minute, and looking into circle as a covener, as a covenant, as one who is at the feet of the goddess, literally, who is going to manifest in some form through the body of the priestess leading the ritual. For those of us who are listening to her speak those words, we, like her, are taken back to the moment when we first had some understanding of what goddess was to us, that it was that two-way, in a way, contract 
that charge of responsibility to us and our loyalty to carrying out the charge as a deed on our part. It does no harm to be at the feet of your priestess who is about to bring the gift of goddess into the circle and be aware of that place because we revisit it constantly in our life. It is a place of beauty and magic, truth and love, total openness and vulnerability. So the priestess reminded and those in the coven reminded brings them to a place that the energy seems to move that much more naturally through the priestess and through the circle. So you can see, that's how I look at the spoken charge before the drawing down of the moon in a group. That's where I see the power of it for those of us who are practicing alone. When we recite the charge in our solitary circles, we are taken to the edge of mystery. We are reminded, in a way, what we're there for, because one of the things she tells us is that we must honor her at the full moon, or at least best it be at the full moon. The power of knowing that we are engaging in that contract with her, speaking her words to us is a reminder of the first time that we heard them and understood them, and we are reminded of our responsibility to her. It brings us, as we are our own priest or priestess, to that place of openness for her visitation. I wrote this in a journal once when I was trying to capture, at the time for myself, what it felt like as a solitary when I found myself practicing alone when I said the charge of the goddess. And it also became powerful as I was again in a coven but was not leading the coven, was in attendance in the coven, to think, what was it like there when my priestess drew down the moon? And she did so with the preamble of the charge. And what was it for me, who might do it the next night on my own, alone? I wrote this. It's a reminder of the true meaning of the poem as summarizing a charge, a pact, a contract, a promise between goddess and myself. It takes me back over and over again to the most intimate moment of my personal dedication to her, when I honored what she brought me and what I would bring to her in return. It reminds me of my relationship with the Divine as one in which there are expectations we both have and my responsibility to that. As a solitary, I don't channel the Goddess into my right the same way I do if I were priestessing a circle. She doesn't come through me and move through me and become what those in the circle need. Instead, it's like a sister or a mother or a grandmother who comes and sits beside me and whispers in my ear and in my heart. What I do when I recite the charge is I again revisit the place of mystery and seeking, which is a journey inward that powerful place that a solitary goes in their rites. And in times of the full moon, in that deepest and most quiet of places, I hear her. I feel as though I'm reminded at least once a month of this promise we've made each other. And it brings me great comfort, it inspires me, and it empowers me to renew that pact at least once a month. We all need to visit as solitaries how we will use the charge of the goddess in our solitary rite. My sharing is that I use it as a preamble that leads me to a place of quiet where I wait and where she comes to me. And always it is a reminder of the promise. To paraphrase some of the charge, I ended my journal entry with this to remind myself of that revisiting every time I use the charge of the goddess in ritual. Whenever I have need of anything, once in the month and best it be when the moon is full. 
Then I visit her in my sacred place, and I adore the spirit of her who is queen of all witcheries. I wish you mirth and reverence. Mary Part. <laughs>